Does anybody get an airplay? We don't have audio in here, do we? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Social Influencers Identifying and Measuring Their Impact in Marketing. Uh, in addition to asking questions in the webinar pane, also be sure to tweet them at Simply Measured with the hashtag SMInfluencers. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect them and address them in a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, we also have a couple of poll questions that you should see on your screen throughout the webinar. Uh, I just popped one up now. And please take a second to fill out your response and we'll share the collective responses in a little bit. Our first question is, what is the estimated size of your company's social followers across all networks? So please select the appropriate response and click submit. I'll give you a few seconds to answer the poll. Okay. So, so far it looks like 80% have less than 50,000, 7% have 50,000 to 100,000, and 7% have 100,000 to 250,000. Uh, so thank you very much for filling those out. Uh, now I'd like to take a minute to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist will be John Dick, the Senior Director of Marketing at Clout. As a senior director of marketing for the premium influencer platform, John has a rich understanding of influencer marketing. Our second panelist is going to be Uri Bar Joseph, the director of marketing for Simply Measured. Uri's experience working with influencers and helping brands understand and measure the impact of their campaigns rounds out our panel. Our third member will be Jess Estrada. Jess is the founder and digital strategist at Fresh Jess Media. Jess is an expert in digital strategy and is a social media influencer who has worked with some of the biggest brands around. So at this point, I'd like to open up our second poll question. Uh, this question is going to be, do you currently have an influencer marketing program? So if you can take a second to answer that question, then I'll close it out and share some of the results. Okay, looks like a good number of you have responded. So 46% of you said no, but you're interested in starting one. That's really good to know. 24% said no, and I'm not sure whether or not I should have one. And 16% says yes, we recently started one. 7% uh, said yes, but it's not working so well. And 7% said yes, and it's awesome. So that's really good context. That'll help our panelists uh, answer some of your questions as we go through the presentation today. Uh, to tell you a little bit about our agenda, today we're going to be talking about finding influencers with clout and then a little bit about influencer marketing from the brand side. And then Jess is going to talk to you about her experience as an influencer and give some tips on how brands can work with influencers from the other side of the table. Uh, then we'll work, run through a few key takeaways from our presentation and open the floor to a Q&A. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them here or with the hashtag SMInfluencers on Twitter. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'd now like to turn it over to John Dick from Cloud. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to thank you all for joining us, um, and I'd like to thank Simply Measured for uh, bringing uh, Clout in for uh, this, this conversation today and for this white paper. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things to just start from a context perspective is, you know, at the heart of any influencer program is the belief that, that people are a powerful distribution channel for your brand message. Um, and so, you know, for everyone on the line who is, uh, you know, is either thinking about it or is, is not sure or has actually uh, launched an influencer platform, you know, you know, I believe and, you know, we at Cloud certainly believe that people are the most powerful content distribution channel and that tapping into people is just a fundamental uh, marketing activity uh, for, uh, you know, modern, modern social marketing. Um, you know, the benefits of, of tapping into people are, are pretty obvious uh, for folks. You know, the first is the creation of authentic content, um, which of course, you know, drives, you know, brand lift. Um, you know, they've done studies on Facebook where you compare just a, a regular ad versus a socially endorsed ad and you see about a 4x brand lift. Um, you know, having people create content means that it reaches more people. Um, you know, right now we're seeing on a lot of 
social channels, uh, you have to put a lot of money down to get reach for your content. And when you have people create content for you, uh, you tend to get a higher reach there. And you know, lastly, when you have people actually um, you know, creating content for you, they put it on the networks where it makes the most sense, um, which, which is a great thing as a marketer not to have to worry about is how do I find the right content to fit this one network. So I just applaud everyone on the line for um, you know, being proactive about thinking about how to tap into people. Um, and so as we uh, move into the first slide here, and we think about um, which are the right people. You know, if people are the most powerful distribution channel for content, you know, we at Cloud certainly believe that influencers are the most powerful people to distribute that content. And so, you know, just to kind of lay the groundwork, and you know, for those who have an influencer program, it might be interesting to think about these three dimensions, um, how they compare to your program. And for those that are considering a program, um, we would propose these three dimensions for how to think about. Um, finding the right influencers for your program. And this is a framework that was, uh, was originally created by uh, the, the, uh, the consulting firm Altimeter, uh, used pretty widely across the influence space. The first dimension when you're thinking about which are the right influencers uh, for your brand is the dimension of reach. Um, and this is, you know, quite simply, how many people, uh, you know, a particular influencer reaches. Um, it's most easily thought of as the size of a person's audience, but we would challenge everyone on the line to think more than just the size of the audience, um, to think instead about um, that they're the right people uh, that, that a person is actually reaching. Um, and so I think that's just an important con consideration is to determine, you know, are the, the influencers that you're going to work with uh, going to reach the right people for your campaign or for your brand? Um, and you know, a good example uh, from some influencer programs that I've seen that really uses reach as a consideration um, are film studios. And so at Cloud, we've done a lot of work with a lot of film studios where um, prior to launching a new movie, uh, a studio will set up several influencer screenings around the country. Um, and for those screenings, the film studios uh, you know, are interested in people with with reach, but maximizing reach is not the priority for them because they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of seats that they can actually give away as part of those screenings. So they are willing to say, "Hey, we don't need as high of a reach. It's more about finding uh, smaller reach people, but but with the right reach." So that's just one example of how you know some people might think of influencer programs and say, "Well, just find the people with the biggest audience," and we would push back on that a little bit and, and focus on the right reach. The second dimension to consider when you're thinking about what influencers uh, to work with is the concept of relevance. Um, and so this is really the, the topic areas that someone has actually established a reputation around online. Um, and the key, of course, is to ensure that uh, you know, their areas of expertise uh, or their passion areas align with your brand or campaign message. Uh, and so you know, one good example that we've seen uh, here at Clout of uh, you know, a brand that really prioritized relevance um, in selecting influencers to work with was Chevrolet when they were launching the Chevy Volt uh, car. You know, they didn't go after traditional uh, car buyers. Who they actually went after were environmentalists, and they wanted people that were uh, influential in the environment because it was an electric car, and they thought that was an important group to actually sway. Um, and so, you know, that's just one example of a, a company that prioritized kind of the relevance uh, piece of it. The third dimension uh, that we would propose that you think about is the concept of resonance. Um, and this really should be thought of as the ability to actually drive action or engagement on social media. So when an influencer creates content on your behalf, do people actually react to it? Do they interact with it? Do they share it? Um, do they reply to it? And you know, resonance is really the piece that makes social social um, and is really one of the benefits of uh, working with people on social media as opposed ju to just doing, doing paid advertisements is that um, you know, having people actually interact and react to, to content is important. Um, you know, a lot of you may have seen that a, a Gallup poll came out today um, that basically did a study of um, whether social media was an effective marketing tool. And something around 60% of people replied that social media didn't have a big impact on their purchase decisions. You know, we interpret that 
to, to mean that the way that social is often being done today from a marketing perspective isn't actually having a big impact on people's purchasing behavior. Uh, and we think that's a big opportunity for brands to say, you know, I need to ensure that people are creating content on my behalf, and particularly are creating content that people want to engage around, because that's where you actually have the opportunity to um, impact people's purchasing behavior. Um, and, you know, resonance, I think, is the piece that's most important to clout. Um, and we'll get into um, the clout uh, measurement algorithm in a minute, um, but it is, it is the most important piece for us is the ability to act, not just create content, it's not just the size of an audience, but it's do people react to it. So uh, jumping onto the next slide here, you know, another way to think about this um, and to make it a little bit more tangible for how you think about your influencer campaigns um, is to kind of break up the tier of celebrity, uh, or I'm sorry, the tier of influencer that uh, you want to work with. Um, and, you know, at the top of the pyramid are really the celebrities. Um, and, of course, celebrities have been endorsing products for over 150 years. Um, it looks like the first uh, celebrity endorsement was actually for a chess set in 1849. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, what we've seen recently, there have been a number of articles posted and research done about celebrity endorsements. It's that they're good for getting attention, but they're not actually great for swaying purchase intent. And in some cases, actually um, detract from people's likelihood of buying a product. So, you know, uh, a recent Experian Marketing Services poll found that 43% of viewers are less likely to buy a product that a celebrity is endorsing. So, great attention getter, maybe not great at actually swaying purchase intent. Um, the next kind of category we think about at, at Cloud, the way that we kind of organize the world, is what you might call a semi-professional, um, and in some cases, fully professional. Um, influencer. And so these are people who have invested uh, a lot of their personal time to grow a large and engaged following um, around the areas that they're passionate about. They're very active content creators to the point that they're entering into formal relationships with brands to be an influencer on their behalf. Um, so they're basically, you know, endorsing different brands um, in, in more formal relationships with those brands. You know, the next tier down and a tier that we at Cloud think is particularly uh, interesting for every marketer to think about is what we might call the citizen influencer. And, um, you know, the citizen influencer is kind of the convergence of a few factors. You know, the first is that, of course, that social media has given um, a much wider group of people the opportunity to, um, you know, establish uh, their, their voice around particular passion areas online. Uh, and uh, the second is that uh, you know, if you track the Edelman Trust Barometer, um, in 2006 a category emerged of, of uh, people that people are trusting called uh, a person like yourself or a person like me. And in the 2014 uh, Trust Barometer, 62% of people say they trust a person like me. And so these are people who, you know, again, citizen influencers are people who are, uh, you know, social content creators. Um, they're pretty active on social. They have grown, you know, some following, but not, not a massive following um, around their particular passion areas. Uh, but people really trust them. Um, and those people are an important uh, group to think about. The last thing that I just want to cover uh, this morning, and it's because, you know, we get a lot of questions about it, um, is how clout is actually um, calculated. Um, and this graphic kind of shows a picture um, of, of how we bring all of the social data to bear uh, within the cloud score and the cloud topic system. And if you look at the evolution and the history of cloud, I'm sure most people have heard of cloud. Um, you know, it all started with social data. And it actually originally just started with Twitter. It's now gone much beyond Twitter. Uh, we have uh, 13 different social networks that are being process, processed as part of uh, our social data algorithm. And social data was great for us, but, um, you know, we knew we had to go further. We had a couple of problems. We had the Warren Buffett problem, uh, where Warren Buffett uh, didn't have particularly high social influence, even though we know how influential uh, Warren Buffett is. We had another problem where Justin Bieber's cloud score was higher than uh, Barack Obama's cloud score. And so we knew that, that, you know, that we needed to bring more data to bear uh, in order to actually get a good measure of someone's influence. So the next category of data we added in was um, real-world influence. 
Um, and we do that uh, from sources like Wikipedia and LinkedIn. Um, and we also have a relationship with Microsoft that gives us access to search data on Microsoft Bing, which is a really powerful um, data set to help establish um, how influential someone is based on trends within search. Um, you know, most people know cloud for the cloud score, but we've actually invested uh, a serious amount of our time and resources, engineering and science resources, into topics. And topics are really, um, like I said before, related to, to relevance. Um, but what are the, the areas that people are passionate about, that they're getting engagement on, that they're driving action around? From there, uh, we've now expanded. If you go to clout.com, you'll see that we offer a set of tools to help people improve their clout, and that's via uh, content creation tools. And uh, lastly, you know, clout was recently acquired by Lithium Technologies, and um, one of the reasons that we're so excited about that, uh, that acquisition is that that's going to give us access to online community data um, that's going to be an incredibly powerful uh, piece of influence data. Um, so when we say online communities, that's um, you know, Lithium Power's uh, you know, on-site communities for uh, a couple of hundred different brands, large brands like Sephora and Skype. Um, and there are incredibly passionate conversations happening in those communities. So, um, anyway, I just thought it would be helpful to just kind of go through a really quick high level, you know, how cloud calculates those things that I mentioned. And, you know, if you look at the cloud score and you want to use cloud as your, your platform, the cloud score is about reach and resonance, um, and cloud topics are about relevance. Um, so I hope, I hope that was a helpful overview. And I'm going to now turn it over to Uri to kind of walk through um, five steps for how you might, might go through your own influencer program. Thanks, John. Um, I, I love the um, the breakdown of uh, reach, relevance, and, and uh, resonance and relevance. Um, and I'm going to use some of it in these five steps. What I want to offer the uh, the audience, everyone who's with us today, is not a comprehensive, you know, list of steps to build a, an influencer program, but the, the few steps that that I believe are important and that you need to go through. And in each of them, I'm going to uh, provide and offer a few tips on, on how to do those um, or take those steps. And I'm going to jump right into it with the first step is um, that talks about the relevancy. Uh, when we talk about influencers, the way that John mentioned it, those, the breakdown into those three elements, um, I believe that relevancy is the starting point because the first of all, you need, first of all, you need to define um, where you where are you looking for those influencers? What is the market that you are trying to influence using those influencers? For example, if you uh, look at my personal family, I'm an influencer with everything that has to do with technology in my family. Uh, but if you um, look at simply measured as a, as, a, as a market or even the tech uh, market, I am nowhere close to be an influencer in that market. So your first step is to define that market. and what I'm trying to show with this Venn diagram is that um, there are many ways to define your market. Um, these four aspects of the market, industry, location, networks, keywords, are only four elements out of um, a long list of elements that you can use to define your market. And with this Venn diagram, I'm not necessarily suggesting that your market is the, the overlap of where you can see the acronym LINK is, uh, but you can define your audience, or I'm sorry, your market as where industry and networks overlap or where industry and location overlaps. If you are interested in sports in Seattle um, in order to uh, uh, influence uh, apparel buying, then you would use those elements of the market to define what is the market that you're trying to go after? So your first step in that process of building an influencer program is first of all define what is that process. Um, and in other words, other words is define the relevancy of that program. The second step is once you define that market is start to try and identify the influencers. Um, and the way that John described it using reach and resonance, you're trying to find who are the, the names that can have more swing in your work around that market. Uh, what we offer here at Simply Measured is a way to do it with our tool, but
But there are other ways to do it. The cloud score that we incorporate into Simply Measured is one way of doing that. Um, looking at who are the people who has the biggest reach in your market. Uh, maybe internal referrals or maybe referrals as a whole. Maybe you should ask people in your market who do they believe are the biggest influencers in that, in that market. Uh, lists that you can um, try and buy or even looking at your competitors. Who are the people who are connected to, the, to your competitors in your market and who, have, who of them have um, the biggest reach um, and resonance? And start to identify those people um, here at Simply Measure, we have an active Google Docs that we maintain on an ongoing basis that we write the people that we believe are the influencers in our marketplace, and we try to build a program around um, engaging with them. Which leads me to the next step of once you identify the influencers, now you want to put together a plan on how you can reach out to those influencers. And these seven tips um, are not necessarily a recipe for success but I believe that you need to go through all of them. The first part is to plan. You need to have a plan on how you want to out, reach out to those influencers. Part of the plan is doing research. Um, we have here Jess, who is uh, based on uh, Klaus' definition as a semi-pro uh, influencer. Um, you want to, if we had a plan of reaching out to Jess, we would do some research. We would learn a little bit about Jess, what she likes, what she doesn't like. Um, what, where, you know, where she posts things online, what networks um, she engages on. We want to use that information to plan the way that we want to reach out to her. Um, the next step is going to be to engage with her. Uh, we know that Jess is a huge Seahawks fan, um, and so if we want to reach out to uh, and engage with Jess, we might retweet something about the Seahawks that she posted um, or send her some Seahawk uh, swag. Um, and in that way, try to engage with her in a meaningful conversation. The second part is the, the next part is be personal. Uh, you want to be you want to make the influencer that you're trying to reach out to feel that you're you're treating them as a person, um, and you want to be personal. You want to send them an email or send them a, even a card, a written card, could work could make uh, wonder wonders in in the way that you can engage with those influencers. Uh, you want to be as personal as, as possible, but also personalize your outreach. Um, write their first name and not last name, um, unless they like to be treated with more uh, formality, and then you should re write their, you know, dear uh, last name. Uh, make sure that you personalize the outreach to them and not go with a generic message. Um, you want to be relevant. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if I'm an influencer in my family about technology, you want to make sure that you, when you reach out to me, if you're trying to sell to my family, uh, you're being as relevant as possible. Um, if, if I'm going to use Jess again as, a, as the example, um, if I want to um, have Jess help me with reach the fashion community in Seattle, I should talk to her about that and not about um, IT software uh, because she can't really help me with that, unfortunately. Um, and then the next, the next tip is white glove. Um, this is very important, and I think that that makes that can make or break uh, an influencer program. You want to treat the influencers that you are trying to reach out to with white gloves. Um, you want to give them a white glove service. Um, make them feel important. Make them feel like the relationship is important. Um, dedicate a person to that relationship. Make sure that you make them feel um, that they are important to you because they are. Um, send them um, information in advance. Uh, send them presents. Uh, send them things that would make them feel like they're being appreciated for the relationship that you have with them. And then at the, bottom, at, at the end, you want to show value. Um, that relationship that you want to create with the influencers in your market should be mutually beneficial. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Uh, but you want to show the value. You want to, when you reach out to them, you want to tell them there's value in this relationship for both of us. I'm being very clear about what is value to me, but I want to be very clear that there's value to you in this relationship as well, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense to them. The next step um, in this program is you need to ask. Um, and I've seen a lot of programs fail 
because the, the companies failed to make the ask. Um, at the end of the day, when you reach out to influencers, there's a goal for this program. So make that ask very clear. I included this cartoon because um, it's all about symbiotic uh, uh, relationship and, and there's unclarity or ambiguity about this relationship. You want to eliminate any ambiguity. If you have a specific request from the influencer that you reach out to, make it very clear up front and make sure that you make it mutually beneficial. Um, I, one more thing that I want to mention here in one of those bullet points is create an experience. Um, I've also seen a lot of uh, influencer programs fail because they didn't create an experience around the brand. Um, I think Jess is going to talk a little bit about that as well, um, so I'm not going to steal our thunder uh, on that. But uh, you want to create an you want to create an ex an experience around the brand in the way that you engage with the influencer. Don't treat them as PR people or media people that their uh, entire purpose is to just amplify your message. They want to see value out of the relationship, and creating that experience creates that value for both sides. The last step, as with everything at Simply Measures, is you need to measure the success of this program. You have goals for this program. You're investing time, money, people, resources, efforts. You want to measure the success of that program. There are multiple ways to measure the success. We obviously uh, recommend Simply Measure for that purpose. Uh, but there are various ways that you can measure the success. Were you able to connect with all your influencers? Are you able to engage with them? Are you getting your message amplified? Are you seeing a lift in mentions? Are you seeing a lift in revenue? Uh, whatever those goals and KPR, KPIs are, you need to have them and you need to make sure that you have a way to measure them. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jess. Jess? Thanks. Uh, I'm going to close out with the influencer perspective. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background of what it is that I do and how I became an influencer. Um, and then from an influencer's perspective, how brands can work with people like me. And I'll close out with some examples of uh, brand partnerships and work that I've done. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. I started a blog in 2008 called Fresh Jets. It's a Seattle life and style blog. Um, I was an events director at uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce here in Seattle, and I wanted to share about different events that were going on in the city, and so I created my blog as sort of that platform. And I've been blogging now for over six years, and it's grown um, into kind of its own uh, brand. I, when I first started out, it was really just a hobby and a labor of love. Um, I started with sharing Seattle events, but I spread out to talking about independent designers um, small businesses and boutiques that I, you know, like shopping at or nonprofits that I love to support, um, and just really, you know, different aspects of my lifestyle. I got really involved um, and, and active on social media, um, Twitter in particular, um, in 2009, and really used it as a, a tool for networking for my blog. I, I wanted to meet other bloggers. Um, somehow fell in the fashion blogging sphere, which um, I was you know, just really happy to meet other bloggers who are experiencing, you know, working with brands or just, you know, wanting to get their networks out there and, and um, getting really active on Twitter. Um, so from there, the next slide, um, I'd say I, w I was blogging as a hot for a hobby um, up until maybe 2010 and 2011, and that's when brands started to reach out to me. Mostly small businesses based here in Seattle. Um, I hosted events here and there. I contributed a couple of written pieces for um, online communities and, and uh, online retailers. Uh, but it was very piecemeal, and it didn't happen very frequently. Um, but it did start, tar start to snowball, especially as I kept being more active on Twitter and, and Facebook and, and whatnot. Uh, and in 2012, I, was signed, I signed with an affiliate network that works with um, major consumer brands um, to partner bloggers on sponsored posts, giveaways, um, brand experiences that involve travel and things like that. And that's kind of uh, where I've taken my blog. That's when I really started to take it seriously. It was in 2012 um, and consider myself more of a professional blogger. 
Um, I was making money from it, and so I started to really study up on um, reading books on blogging and, and you know, how to grow uh, my presence online and grow my personal brand, um, and really pay attention to how I worked with brands and which ones I had great partnerships with, which ones you know, we kind of grew together and which ones were just not working really well. Um, that eventually led to uh, me working for myself. I left the agency I was working for uh, about two years ago and uh, I just wanted to say hi really quickly because I know they're online and watching me on a big screen <laughs> right now. Um, and I uh, left to pursue blogging more on a full-time basis. Um, I, I take on freelance writing gigs and some really small uh, social media consulting gigs on the side, but for the most part, I created a space to um, blog full time for myself and work with different brands in that capacity. Um, and in the next slide, I want to talk about some sort of uh, the complementary side to what Yuri uh, spoke to and how to work with brands, but more from an influencer perspective. Um, in the next couple of slides forward, I'll show you some of the specific work that I've done, but these are the kinds of things that I've gleaned that have worked really well um, as far as brands reaching out to influencers and then in that relationship and building that process. Um, as Yuri said, you know, doing your research and finding the right bloggers is really key. Um, the blogger sphere has grown so, you know, so large and just exponentially since I started blogging in 2009 and there's just so many out there. There's a lot of um, really big name and marquee bloggers, specifically in fashion um, and uh, mommy and lifestyle as well. They can make a lot of money working with brands and more often than not they're signed to maybe a talent agency or an affiliate network like I'm signed to. Um, I, as a, from the brand perspective, I wouldn't recommend working just pointing out bloggers because they're popular. I'd really think about whether or not a blogger aligns with your, uh, or sorry, influencer aligns with your brand values, uh, your core values and your mission. Does that influencer appeal to your audience? Um, and you know, do they already are they already um, sharing content on their social media and other platforms um, that resonate with your brand? Um, so doing your research in that sense is also really key. Um, being patient. Uh, some of us bloggers do this full time, and, and influencers, and especially when you're um, when you're talking to influencers who don't necessarily have a blog. Um, whether that's a YouTube star or someone who's really um, who's got a big Instagram audience, um, be patient. They're not. They're likely not doing this full time. Um, it takes time to build really great relationships, and um, you know I've engaged with many brands on more than one occasion over a period of you know a few months or a few years even. Um, and each experience for me as, a, as on the influencer side um, is more seamless and more organic um, in that relationship and, and in turn that makes me more invested in that relationship and want to share it more naturally with my uh, different audiences, whether that's my blog or social media channels. Um, as Yuri said, specifying your goals, being really clear up front with what you want out of the influencer, whether that's a specific number of tweets, um, specific messaging and hashtags. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with a brand that wants maybe a sponsored post and then follows up after that post has gone up and said, oh, can you edit this to um, you know, include our hashtags or specific links or you know, can you tweet this out now or send a couple of Instagrams out. And that, for me, that's, not, that, that's more detrimental to our um, contract or to our relationship because those kinds of things weren't specified. They take up both of our time um, and more often than not, the messaging becomes very muddy and um, it's, it's harder for an influencer to share it more organically from their voice. Um, Yuri also mentioned creative um, customization and just you know creating really great experiences that are unique to bloggers and or influencers and their audiences. Um, give that influencer that you're working with some editorial and creative control. I know that there's some specific things that that brands would like to convey, whether that's launching a new product a new event, um, or maybe just building their social channels, um, but you know, giving them kind of the, the bare bones that they need to then create a whole experience on their own that's unique to their readers. They know their readers best and they know how to speak to them. Um, keeping it real, um, setting expectations, giving clear examples of what you're looking for out of the influencer, um, and if you don't necessarily have examples, helping paint that picture for them so they understand what, what you want from them. Um, 
set, setting benchmarks, but also knowing that you know with a customized partnership or experience with each influencer, that outcome might not necessarily match what your uh, what the expectations are. Um, but setting those out um, in the open was, or is really helpful as well. And I'll finish up here with a few actual partnerships that I've done. Um, and I wanted to show a different variety of the things that I've, I've worked on with brands. Um, event hosting with a, a small um, eyeglass company here in Seattle. Um, contributed some expertise in the sense of um, identifying small businesses for Guilt City in their um, newsletter and their, their uh, bi-weekly deals that come out. Um, I did a fun campaign with Microsoft on, on the Surface launch and the, uh, the Microsoft Store pop-up in Times Square a couple of years ago. And they actually, um, their PR team flew a few influencers out to the store to kind of help launch it. Um, they did like a 26-hour um, opening day kind of thing. And they filmed us, took photos of us in the store playing with a product. Then they gave us all the content and allowed us to share that with our audiences, whether that's our blog, Pinterest, YouTube, um, in our own voice. So that was really great, and I really liked having that experience. And then um, the last slide, like I said, I've worked a lot with um, different fashion brands, whether that's um, being featured in marketing materials. Um, and I've actually contribute, I contribute pretty regularly um, written pieces, whether that's um, being part of an article or um, marketing uh, content for newsletters and things like that. Um, and then I, I'm pretty heavy in fashion, but I do consider myself a lifestyle blogger. And so I do a lot of work with um, household consumer items, um, you know, food, beverage, uh, and uh, a little bit with automobiles. So I wanted to share you know, an experience that I had with Cadillac recently where um, they loaned out a car for a couple of days, and I took it around the city and um, got to share my experience on my blog. Again, you know, they gave me the product, but allowed me full editorial control on um, what I shared. So, um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell and some of the work that I've done. If you have any questions, we're welcoming them at um, hashtag SMInfluencers um, and then in the webinar as well. Okay, so you can see on your screen some of the key takeaways from each of our speakers today. I want to thank John, Jess, and Uri. Uh, so now we're going to begin answering some of the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the question pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, the first question that we actually got quite a few of is, what's the best way to identify the right influencer for your particular industry and business size? Um, so probably from the brand side, Uri and John from Cloud on some tactics that you guys might uh, encourage there. Um, sure, I'll, I'll take it first and John you can, you can follow up on this. Um, there are a few ways to do that and I mentioned a few steps. Again, I would start with defining your market. Um, and then I really like the, the kind of the influence pyramid that John shared from Cloud. Um, We've seen a lot of success with actually targeting or, or, or um, engaging with people who are in that middle bracket, the citizen influencer, people who have uh, bloggers, but maybe not to the extent of uh, Jess's uh, influence, but more in very niche markets that are willing to have um, an ongoing engagement with us um, that have real influence on their immediate market. Uh, the numbers might have been small uh, in terms of how much reach they had, but they really had strong resonance um, in their market. Um, so I would start by, first of all, identifying the market and then just going through lists of, um, of people, doing research online, asking people around you, um, doing search on Twitter, and, and obviously using Simply Measure that we can pull a lot of that information into our reports, whether it's uh, a Twitter report, a Facebook report, a cross-channel report that we pull a lot of the different social media networks, and then highlight the biggest influencers based on both topics and cloud score. Um, so Simply Measure could be a great uh, solution to identify those influencers in your market. Uh, John? Yeah, you know, I'll just add on to what, what Uri just said. Um, you know, a, a couple of other quick things that come to mind. You know, number one, I, you know, 
influencer uh, marketing is definitely an investment of time. Um, there, you know, I think that uh, in order to succeed at it, I think that it's it's crucial, and, and you know, Uri went through this in his that you have an authentic relationship um, with people, and that it's not just expected that it's a it's a one way street where they just post content for you. Um, you know, a couple of other, you know, if you're looking for a very quick way to go about doing it, you know, we, like Club, for instance, offers the Club Perks program where, um, you know, it allows you to really easily tap into our system to find a group of influencers and to actually have Club facilitate uh, an interaction with them. Um, so there are, um, you know, companies even besides Cloud that offer the opportunity um, to kind of uh, jumpstart a program and get a program launched. But ultimately, you know, there, it's important, I think, that everyone understands that, that it does take some time. Um, you know, we believe the benefits are great of doing it, um, but, but to find the right people, to uh, cultivate a relationship with those people, and to then, um, you know, help those people, as Jeff kind of said, you know, help those influencers actually, um, you know, share good content for your brand. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, Jeff, I had a question for you here. Someone wanted to know how an influencer would uh, kind of pursue being contacted by brands. So how do you reach out to brands or make sure you're visible to them? So I, I'm actually not as, probably not as good at this as other bloggers that I know of. Um, I, I do it a lot more organically as far as um, if I'm talking about a brand, I'll make sure that I tag them on social media, um, use any hashtags they might be using as well, um, which is really easy to do on Instagram and Twitter. It's a lot harder um, on Facebook, especially with uh, privacy settings. Um, but that's kind of the way that I like to go about getting noticed by brands. Um, and occasionally, I'll maybe email them directly. Um, other bloggers I know will, will actually pitch um, brands that they want to work with and they'll show specific examples of posts that they've done um, or, you know, tweets uh, and, what, and whatnot. Um, and, you know, they, I think a blogger, when they want to work with a brand um, and they definitely know their stuff, they will have a media kit um, and share some, it, can, it sounds a lot fancier than it is, but at the very minimum, um, share some stats with that brand around, um, you know, what kind of audience and how big that audience is, whether that's um, blog readers, page views and visitors, or social media following numbers. Um, I have both in my own media kit. Um, and then beyond that, they'll pitch a couple of ideas of how they can work together, whether that's through a sponsored post or a specific product launch and whatnot. Um, so there's different ways to go about it um, from an influencer's point of view. Uh, you can do it a little more organically like myself, or you can be a lot more proactive, which I know a lot of bloggers do. Awesome. We actually had a great follow-up question to that from Twitter that I wanted to throw at you real quick. Uh, so being on the receiving end of influencer outreach yourself, what are some tactics that marketers need to steer clear of? Don't start emails with dear blogger. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've talked a lot about doing your research, personalization, and customization in this webinar, and that's for good reason. Um, a lot of times, influencers will get roped in with uh, maybe a media list where it's um, a pitch to journalists who are used to seeing kind of generic things that they can turn around really quickly. Um, but for maybe bloggers or social media influencers, uh, that experience needs to be a lot more customized in, in that we need to understand why you reached out to us, and if it's a blanket uh, pitch email, we can spot that from a million miles away. And more often, I can't tell you how many times, maybe I'd say 90% of the emails that I get that are just standard PR pitches are things I'd never even read or talk about on my blog. Um, and I always have to wonder whether or not they read my blog in the first place to even identify it as, some, as you know, like I said, choosing the right bloggers is so key because, you know, it shows me that you're not doing the research the right way and that there's no value for me there to share your product or launch. Great, thanks. Uh, and I'd like to jump in on that also, uh, Kevin, and, and agree with Jeff that the, the, the initial reach out to an influencer can be a very awkward period, and I think it's important to establishing uh, the right relationship with someone. You know, I think a few things to keep in mind uh, about different tiers of influencers. You know, the citizen influencer is one of the things that I think is wonderful about working with citizen influencers 
is that they're more often than not they're they're delighted to be contacted and recognized by a brand. Um, like I don't know about everyone on the phone, but for me, for instance, like I find when you know a brand that I love retweets me or replies to one of my tweets, like that feels really good to me, um, especially if it's a brand brand that I uh, am passionate about. And so you do have an opportunity with the citizen influencers, particularly who don't get contacted by you know you know tens or hundreds of brands on a regular basis. Um, to, to really delight them as part of the process, and I would just keep that in mind. Um, when you work with, you know, one of the benefits of working with a platform like Clout or another, you know, influence platform is that, um, you know, we are basically the middleman between a brand and an influencer, and that um, some brands really like because, you know, they work with us and then we contact the influencer basically on their behalf. And the influencers like because um, they're able to say no if they don't want to participate, and it doesn't really get awkward for them. So if you are feeling like that's going to be an awkward process for you, um, you can always work with with one of the platforms like Clout um, to um, facilitate that that transaction. That's great. Thanks, John. Uh, another question here, probably for John Endery. Uh, so there are moments in your when your industry may be at fault for one thing or another and the people that you influence aren't uh, too excited about it. So what's the correct way to act in moments like this um, when you are working with influencers who are going to be upset about something your brand did when their name is on the, on the hook for that? Um, I would say um, if, if it's appropriate, start with an apology. Um, I mean, the, from my perspective, an influence program is all about relationship. Um, you're trying to build a relationship with a person, um, and even though it's a brand, it's basically two, two brands. It's your brand as the company and the brand of the influencer as the person. Um, there are, it's still about people. Um, so if mistakes, were happen, if mis mistakes happen and they were um, innocent mistakes, start with an apology, explain, um, have a conversation with the person on the other side um, because it's all about salvaging the relationship and then come up with a plan on how you can uh, uh, position both brands, the, your company's brand and the influencer brand, um, in the best light possible uh, given the circumstances. Um, it's very uh, generic, the, the question about the crisis, but if it's, if it's a real crisis and, and somehow the influencer uh, is in, involved or their name is being pulled into that conversation, um, I would try to make sure that their brand is not getting hurt. Great. Uh, another question we had was once you're working with an influencer and lose contact with them, what are some of the best ways that you can re-engage with them and get them activating for your brand again? Um, that's a that's a delicate question because the, you need to be careful. Um, first of all, you need to understand why um, they went dark on you. Like if you had a relationship with them and it was engaging and there was some connection, and all of a sudden they went, they start they stopped responding. Um, I think there might be something underneath that you need to uncover. Did something happen? Um, so start with that before you uh, bombard them with with messages, and you need to be careful about. Uh, there might be some fatigue uh, behind it. There might be maybe the influencer wants some cool down uh, period. Um, so you need to be very careful about um, your request and your frequency. Um, and then again, it's about relationship and there's a person on that other side. So if you build a good relationship between yourself, uh, the brand or the person in your company that manages, manages that program, then make sure that you reach out personally and have uh, a person-to-person -person conversation, um, and then take it from there. Um, again, I I don't think I can say it enough. It's about relationship, and it's about the relationship that you have as a company, and for the person who manages that relationship in your company with that influencer. Um, and like every relationship, some relationships go through uh, um, difficulties, and you need to navigate through those. I will say. Um just to kind of reiterate what Yuri's saying, uh, it really depends on how the contact was left off last. Um, if it was a positive thing, then most likely um, 
you know, it's maybe just busyness and time, whether that's on the brand's end um, or on the influencer side. You know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of influencers, especially those who are not bloggers, um, have full-time jobs and have other obligations, and a lot of them do experience burnout. Um, I can't tell you how many bloggers or people I've met over the years who, you know, they get married or they get a new job, um, and they just they stop blogging, <laughs> or they they stop blogging for a while and then come back. Um, so in that sense, you know, maybe do some quick research on whether or not they're active on some social media channel or have recently started blogging again, and then just send them an email and check in from that sense. Um, if it feels like it might have been a negative last point of contact, then it might be worth having a private conversation with that influencer. And if you know, if then if it gets to the point where, it's, you know, we need to resolve what happened, and and you know, if the brand really wants to work with that influencer, then I'm sure that, you know, just like any relationship, that you know, some kind of resolution can be worked out. It's just kind of pinpointing how that conversation left off and picking how to pick up the most you know, gracefully and professionally from there. I think it also highlights the importance of setting the right expectations for this, for this relationship. Uh, Jeff mentioned before that some influencers work with you know, agencies or, or with, even with contracts, and then things are more formalized. Uh, John mentioned the fact that cloud can facilitate some of that relationship, and that makes it a little bit more formal. Um, in some cases, you work in an informal way with, with influencers and, or with people who influence in your market, um, it's important to set the right expectations uh, and to be clear about what you're expecting out of this relationship. Um, it sounds like a, a life coach adv um, advice, but but it's true even for you know for the, your influencer program. All right, so I think we have time for one more question here, uh, John. This question was for you, but I want to leave it open after that for Uri and Jess to chime in as well. What's the best way to locate a citizen influencer in your particular industry or even a geographic location? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, it ends up, uh, you know, I guess I would, I would, first of all, I would say clout. Um, but, you know, <laughs> outside, um, I, you know, there are a couple things that I would say. You know, number one, Again, as, as Uri kind of walked through, um, you know, there are other tools besides cloud that leverage metrics like cloud that help you kind of um, prioritize people um, and to look for ways to kind of quantify, um, you know, whether or not they are right for your brand or campaign. Um, so if you use an example, you know, we would say if you see, you know, going back to the slide with the pyramid on it, you know, we would say citizen influencers really fall between the cloud score of 50 and 65. And so, you know, this is like a very uh, simple hack that you can use, but there's, you know, a cloud browser plugin for, you know, Firefox or for Safari um, or for Chrome that will display the cloud scores um, if you're in Twitter and looking at a feed. And so you can literally start searching um, for, you know, people that are either talking about the industry, the you know your brand, um, to people who might already have some interest in you, um, and look for those people that are kind of in that mid tier um, that are driving engagement around their network and actually um, reach out to them directly. Or as Uri went through, uh, you know, leverage simply measured as a tool to actually run reports that will show you who those people are, and instead of just focusing on the people with, you know, a high cloud score of seventy plus, um, you know, focus on that mid tier group. Um, yeah, I I uh, I personally love the the starting point of keywords. Um, I think keywords are extremely important in general, not just in influencer. Uh, they can be used in social media in general, in SEO, in PPC. So if you're a marketer, you're using keywords anyway. Uh, so take those keywords and start your research of finding people based on keywords. Um, go to go to the network, search for those keywords, see who, who are the people who are talking about them, utilize uh, solutions like cloud and simply measured to find those people. I would use keywords as your proxy um, in most cases, and then you can layer other elements like geolocation, um, age, um, industry, a lot of other elements that, that can define better that market and start weeding out those people. 
And you're going to end up with a list. Let's say you're going to end up with a list of 100 people. Start working through that list. Add some information about those people um, and work through that list. Uh, you're not you're not going to know how effective it is until you start. So at the end of the day, you just need to start. Um, so find a list and start going through it. A lot some of it is just trial and error. All right. Well, thank you all very much. A huge thank you to Uri, John, and Jess, and thanks to everyone for attending today's webinar. We had a ton of great questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, but we will have a follow-up blog post on the Simply Measured blog later this week with answers to all of those questions. If you have any other questions, please contact us at blog at simplymeasured.com. And once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey about the presentation, and we'd love if you would complete that and provide your feedback so we can make sure that we're giving you the best experience possible in our upcoming webinars. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view today's recording of the webinar. On behalf of Simply Measured, Clout, and Jess, we'd love to thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.